Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, and welcome to this afternoon's um, IHS virtual information session, uh, introducing the individual master's tracks as part of the um, urban management and development uh, master track that we offer here at IHS. Uh, today, we will be introducing the strategic urban planning and policies master's track, managing social spatial dynamics for sustainable cities. Um, so just looking quickly at some of the people we have in the chat room already. Uh, welcome. I, I recognize some names, some people who are um, have already applied to us. Um, I see lots of names that I don't know yet. So I imagine there's quite a lot of prospective students here. Um, so I hope this is an informative session. Uh, we will be running through um, a number of different aspects, introducing IHS as an institute and then really digging into the um, the course content of this master's track and also talking about sort of the uh, the alumni journeys of a lot of our um, alumni network as well. So can we move to the next slide, please? Yes. So um, as I said at the beginning, we've prepared a short um, a short presentation, about 20 to 30 minutes. The idea is to give you as much information as possible um, as you begin uh, the journey to potentially making an application to IHS. So uh, my name is Fergal Raftree and I'm the admissions officer here um, at IHS. So what I will do is I'll provide a short introduction to IHS as an institute um, and the uh, urban management development masters uh, master's course that we offer here. Um, and then I'll hand over to the uh, academic course coordinator, uh, Dr. Alexander Yaknow, who will talk a bit more about the uh, course content in more detail. Um, and also we'll uh, spend some time to really focus on the student experience of the program as well. Uh, some of the recent uh, research topics that have been completed um, and some of the uh, jobs that our alumni have gone on to do after graduating with us. Um, as I said, at the end, we'll deal some more with the practical matters, uh, admission requirements, important dates, uh, but we've left most of the time for a Q&A session. So if you do have any questions during the presentation, please do uh, feel free to put them in the chat box. At the end of the session, we'll circle back and we'll answer them one by one. Uh, so I hope it's an informative session and thank you very much for changing the slide. So um, as I said at the beginning, uh, the uh, Strategic Urban Planning and Policies Master's Track is one of six master's tracks that comprises the Urban Management and Development Master's course that we offer here at IHS. Um, so this is our flagship master's program and every year we welcome roughly 100 to 150 urban specialists in one of these six um, fields of expertise. Um, the program is broken down into an intensive 12 month um, program starting in September every year. Uh, block one will welcome you to uh, the program um, and will provide a sort of a curriculum that is focused on introducing a number of urban theories, as well as a number of practical social science skills and research methods that are designed to really um, act as a solid basis for you to um, then apply them towards your specific specialization or master track that you're interested in. So typically in um, block one, you'll be looking at uh, topics including urban theories, um, uh, research methods, as I mentioned, uh, public-private partnerships, and how local uh, governments finance and um, drive investment in uh, cities. Um, and then once we have this sort of uh, groundwork, you'll be then moving to block two, where you'll work more exclusively within your chosen master's track. Um, applying the skills that you've get gained in block one uh, within a specific case studies. Uh, we build the program this way because this is all working towards you beginning your uh, thesis period. Uh, this starts roughly in March every year and runs all the way through the summer until sort of August when we have graduation. Um, so quite a long thesis period, which includes sort of data collection, field work, um, as well as sort of writing up of your final thesis. So um, this is sort of a, a brief overview of the program, uh, but I'll now hand over to uh, my colleague Alex, who will talk about the strategic urban planning faculty in more detail. Thank you very much, Virgil. Uh, hello and welcome to everybody who is joining in. Uh, as you see, I'm today the only one who is representing a team. Uh, our team is recently also refurbished, so to say we get new colleagues in. So. It will be a surprise situation for all of you, and uh, hopefully not so much for me, uh, who will teach you in the next um, year. But uh, for now, uh, we definitely count with Carolina Luneta, who is Brazilian, uh, who has been with IHS since five years already, and who is um, now also teaching mainly uh, in, in planning specializations and uh, with this focus, with a special focus on gentrification and on gender. 
And you've got Elena Pezzani, who unfortunately you will not meet anymore because she's leaving us for ICLE, uh, which you might have uh, heard about. It's uh, one of the bigger and older networks on climate change and urban um, um, areas, uh, cities, local governments actually in, in the name. And she will be, um, there is a, a you, I'm, I'm too slow. <laughs> George, thank you. For... So Elena uh, has been with us for two years and now is leaving for another job position. Uh, next slide, please. So what we teach at uh, our specialization is uh, actually rather broad and deep at the same time. I know that most of us claim that, but uh, it is in fact true for us because we look into spatial issues. We look into uh, everything that is related to planning um, development space. Um, and it is focused on a kind of understanding that is socio-spatial. We understand that cities are made by humans, they are made for humans, uh, but not always perfectly functioning. So we also try to find out where the tensions are, why cities don't work as they should be, what kind of challenges they have for their resilience, if you think about climate change, social conflict, and everything else. Uh, so it is not necessarily a planning uh, theory class that would always discuss only the planning aspect, but it looks also into the whole dynamic and the complexity of urban areas. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, that's me. Um, I'm originally German. I've been working abroad for the last 20 years, more or less. I hardly touch ground. And if I'm back, then I would go to Berlin, which is the best city in the world. But again, my, most people might want to say things like that. But in my case, it's true. Berlin is, I think, one of the best uh, interesting uh, and socially uh, balanced cities, but also there is conflict. So uh, never think that any city can be perfect, can be a perfect product. Well, I've been uh, working in uh, Brazil, in Mexico, in Argentina, and uh, before coming to IHS, I was in South Asia. I worked in Nepal and in Bangladesh. Um, I had several assignments uh, all over Asia. I was in India, in Indonesia, um, in Vietnam, and, and a few other countries. Uh, and uh, recently we've worked uh, strongly in Africa. We have done research on land development in Uganda and Somaliland. We've been frequently involved in think tanks in Kenya, East African think tanks. Uh, we also work in uh, Ghana and Namibia. Uh, we've at this moment doing a study for an urban development fund in Namibia. And it's always very good for us to also take this as case study. So what we do in practice, we try to bring into the classroom. Uh, and in Latin America, we have at the moment uh, a bigger engagement with Ecuador, where the Ministry of Urban Development and Housing is requesting us for helping them to build policies. Uh, so my, my background as a teacher is I've, I've been working uh, in TU Berlin before. I've been now teaching in an IHS for more than eight years. Uh, and uh, for all of us, the whole team, it's always important to understand what uh, the students bring in, the participants of the course. So we, we understand a co-creation of knowledge. It's not you will not have uh, a frontal classroom teaching with us. We will work in teams. We will work in working groups. We try to find out what uh, the differences between your experiences are, and then also try to, to uh, draw some lessons from this. Uh, we have a very strong, as I said, very strong um, focus on socio-spatial, which also includes governance, institutions, who is responsible, who makes the city, who owns the city. These are our, our questions. And in consultancy, yeah, uh, you can have read that in the moment. Uh, so I work on campus development mainly, uh, which means all kinds of trainings, uh, but also as policy advisor for governments and uh, for international organizations such as UN Habitat, UNESCO, uh, the GIZ, the German Development Corporation, the KFW, the Financial uh, Development Corporation of the Germans, DFID uh, has financed, the UK aid has financed our research in uh, Uganda and Somaliland uh, and a couple of things. And uh, yeah, as a researcher, this also maybe to explain that because Ferg has mentioned uh, in IHS, we strongly believe in this tribalization of knowledge that we teach and we learn from the students, with, that we advise and we learn from, from the reality, from the context. And the research, that means we also apply our methods to, um, to amplify our knowledge. And we work uh, here mainly on questions of justice, 
on, on city access uh, that includes systems and governance. And uh, of course, as you all know, urbanization is the big thing of the century. Uh, we all have uh, an accelerated growth. We experience an, an accelerated growth in all continents except for Europe, um, which uh, brings us to find new solutions towards uh, urban development and to think different because we cannot build the cities with the knowledge that we had before. Next slide, please. So what I uh, already mentioned, we want to engage you in a reflective practice regarding our planning and governance, the socio-spatial dynamics. We want to help you to develop a future orientation as um, uh, also coordinator for multi-stakeholder approaches we understand an urban manager is somebody who is really uh, skilled in bringing different aspects together, different stakeholders, different actors, so they come can come to a consensus and they can build a city together, which is absolutely essential because a city cannot build for one interest group. It has to be built for everybody who's living there. And that is the main challenge. Uh, and that also includes a value dimension, value not only like there is this interesting thing about value that we can understand economic value or ethical values or religious religious values, uh, but a value dimension includes everything. So we should not ju just uh, focus on, on uh, the economic value of a city, but also of the, on all the others. Uh, and uh, yes, you should be after one year, you should be really proudly calling yourself an urban manager and planner. Uh, that's our aim. And uh, from previous batches, we have the good experience that people were really jumping into it afterwards and had um, have, have done uh, tremendous work also. Like after eight years, I can really proud myself as having taught a number of people that are now in really interesting positions and, and doing good things. Next. Yeah, why? I think I said everything, why you should study with us. Uh, but I also want to tell you why not. So uh, if you are more looking into uh, a method heavy uh, um, academic career, SUPP might not be uh, the best place to go. It definitely will help you uh, to, to develop your creative thinking. It will help you to gain stakeholders. So you, you would be an interactor. Uh, and uh, you would also learn about real life case studies. So you should be equipped for real life scenarios, not so much for a heavy theory. Uh, and uh, you would also be used serious gaming and we just put serious in front of it. So it doesn't look as it's only fun, but it is actually only fun. So, and a bit of learning. So what we try to do with you is we try to develop games, uh, gamification of scenarios of consultancies, etc., so that you also have uh, a, a much easier going approach towards uh, um, planning. Next slide, yes. So um, yes, now I'm going to start repeating myself, so do not bore you too much. Socio-spatial dynamics I've mentioned, which is again, this interaction that creates a city. Uh, I talked about the planning, the, the policy, strategic planning is, is very uh, relevant. Uh, so we also believe in master planning. It's not that we say all is tactical urbanism now and we have to make micro interventions. It is also to assess uh, and understand the bigger planning frameworks, uh, master planning. We do actually, I, I didn't mention Kerala. I'm working on a, on, a, on a very interesting project on resilient initiative Kerala in India, where uh, we are reviewing master plans and discussing master plans with the different stakeholders in terms of the risk relevance, are they risk informed enough? Are they uh, good enough for bouncing back better for the next flooding or landslide situation? So this kind of planning initiative is also very relevant for, for our teaching uh, and again, stakeholder. What, what can stakeholders do? What are their competences? What are their mandates? What are the responsibilities? Do they know this? Uh, where are the gaps? Where are the overlaps? So all this will be part of, of the teaching. Um, yeah, uh, I think uh, to, to, to use this last uh, term of, of the slide, sustainability justice principles, uh, we strongly believe that this goes together. Sustainability can only be created if there is justice. Uh, anything that is an imbalance of society does not create a sustainability, especially the sustainability is a balance between economic, uh, environmental and social values. 
So we, we try to look into all of them. We look into nature-based solutions as, as one of the, the big things coming up at the horizon, thanks to God, because I think that's, that's the only solution that we have to make our cities better. Next slide. <clears throat> yeah, that maybe Virgo wants to say something about this. <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely. Because, yes. <clears throat> um, so something that I also wanted to say is, um, um, IHS benefits from uh, has a lot of infrastructure around it that really feeds into the program that we offer at IHS. I mean, um, I'm not going to try and uh, contest with Berlin necessarily, but Rotterdam really is a, an extremely dynamic uh, global city in which to sort of examine uh, social spatial interventions and urban development uh, more generally as well. Um, there's a huge amount of innovation happening within the city. Um, there's a highly mobilized uh, network of young individuals who are working in the sector. Um, this feeds very much into sort of the alumni journeys that we might talk about a little bit later in the presentation. But just to say that um, IHS is part of the alumni, um, but a part of the uh, um, Erasmus University as well. Uh, we're highly sort of uh, in, uh, embedded within the uh, campus and have the, um, access to all of the um, facilities that are available within uh, that, as well as sort of um, opportunities to network and sort of build out your uh, connections whilst you're studying with us. Um, and on top of that, you also benefit from um, getting a qualification from a, a top 100 university. Um, so something that we really focus on within your uh, time at IHS is to give you as enriched sort of experience as possible. So this might be um, uh, field trips and sort of applied learning and sort of looking at different in uh, urban innovations, maybe in Rotterdam or elsewhere in the Netherlands. And um, this will also be a program of sort of guest lecturers that uh, feed it directly into the program. Uh, these are normally sort of very established professionals within the sector, maybe working in theory, they might be PhD candidates, they may also be uh, people that are working for large uh, uh, organizations, and we have active uh, collaborations with uh, people at UN Habitat and other uh, organizations as well. So I would always say to students, it's an intensive program, but we've really taken a lot of effort, uh, both in the academic sort of field and in the um, uh, student experience field to make sure you have an, a, an, as an enriched uh, experience as possible. That really makes for a, a good sort of experience for the one year that you'll be with us. Uh, so can we move on to the next slide, please? Alex, maybe you can speak a little bit more about the teaching methods, please. Yeah, I said before, what we try to do with classroom and thanks also to the universe that we are back to the classroom uh, teaching. We, we interact a lot. We, we give a lot of um, attention to, to uh, interaction in the in groups. So we have lectures, but that are not like 50 minutes frontal, but also in a, in a discussion, a dialogue. We look for, for getting into your knowledge, tap into it, use it, make little meta plan cards out of this and put it on the board. You can see that on the on the pictures. And uh, we do appreciate group work, which means that uh, people that come to our specialization, our master track, are actually uh, interested also in peer learning and, and working together. Uh, sometimes this is, of course, not always the easiest way, but I think it's, it's a way to ensure that um, you also you, you, you have a, bitter, a better, a bigger outcome. And what I mentioned before, the serious gaming. Serious gaming is an approach that is academically very sound and, and very relevant. And it really helps to uh, enjoy what you're doing uh, because you will test it out. You will quasi experiment. You will work with uh, different kind of uh, people and you make them into playing cards and you will work on boards that are some kind of fantastic cities or real city scenarios. So all this, this helps us tremendously to also understand our own profession. Next. So as to, to give you the example, Fergal mentioned that it's quite an intense year. So you will have your introduction, then you have your master track, then you go into your thesis approach. Actually, we encourage you to start thinking about your thesis as soon as possible, but to, to tailor it down to, to a, a feasible thesis by January, February, March is still good enough, but then you really should go. 
And these are a few of the uh, thesis titles. You can see that these are very long, but I think it's also important to understand that thesis should be very specific. You cannot write a thesis about urban development in Ghana, but you can definitely write one about a specific neighborhood, a specific informal settlement uh, in Ghana, and then you can compare it, so quasi-experimental, uh, with, with other informal settlements elsewhere. Uh, you can also see that uh, we look into all kinds of social issues, so uh, it is also about commercial, like local economic development. Uh, lately, of course, we have a lot of interest in uh, research in COVID, COVID cases, and how these have influenced um, specific economies and then also cities. Uh, and then um, I think there is something cut, at least in my slide. Um, you cannot fully see. So with, uh, these, uh, with the one on influencing participatory planning approach and disaster risk management case study in Kampala was one of the, the one that, um, yeah, let me, um, let me get, get back to the questions in a moment. I see the question popping up, but I can't see the whole slide, but I think it's not important. So that's the impression that we want to give you. Everything is possible as long as there is a spatial urban relation, but even with the urban, we are not too picky because we also understand that urban and rural are not a, a, a made dichotomy, but it is actually something of the same. So we also think about territorial approaches. If you have a relevant rural research, you are most welcome to do this also. Next. Coming to our wonderful alumni. I hope a few of you will be a part of this batch in, in the next presentation in a year or two. So we've got Casper uh, Trump, who is an um, planner at Yacht. We have Richard Ligung here, who is uh, in Rwanda, who uh, is actually at the moment working for green urbanization at the Green Roads Institute in Rwanda. Um, and uh, yeah, I will not read out the quotes, please, please read them by, them, by yourself. Uh, but I can tell you that we have always a very, very international group. We often have 15, 20 different nationalities within a group of 20 to 25 people. And um, we have, uh, I think, a very good interaction between the, the different nationalities or ethnicities or, um, yes, thank you. So there is, there is more of it. Uh, Diana from Kenya, Noor from Pakistan, uh, Bregas from Indonesia, Okti from India, Felix from Uganda, sorry, from Kenya, and uh, Maya actually from uh, US and Greg. Thank you. Um, yeah, again, you can see where, where we got, I, I think we need to update this because we have uh, now also students from, from uh, other countries. Um, but no, that that's, looks very recent. Uh, good. So um, it always makes a big <laughs> difference if yes, US Americans and, and Russians on this world map. So thank you, Fergal, for presenting this. Uh, but uh, this is one of these maps that shows the north much bigger than the south. So I don't like it so much because it doesn't show how big Africa is in comparison to US America. And actually, US America, not Canada, should be also blue. Uh, we have uh, a number of US Americans this year. Uh, we had also Norwegians and, um, yeah, well, but from the top of my head, Mexicans definitely also. Uh, right. So, again, you can see the previous experience uh, um, consultants, project manager, lecturer, architect. We have a number of university professors now that have uh, studied with us. Uh, we have, uh, yeah, many people that come in to learn to bring broaden their knowledge as architects and then work also in more urban design or um, planning specific uh, careers. Uh, and uh, of course, we have a lot of strategies. It's actually also interesting to see that um, all of our students are well distributed among public sector, private sector and NGOs. So uh, there is no specific direction that you push people towards. Uh, maybe from, from my own experience also, I think that, that the public sector requires much more talent, much more competences. So we, we are very happy if people come from the public sector and want to go back to the public sector. But we have uh, many people that work later in private consultancies and, and NGOs. Next. Yeah, um, I'm starting to repeat myself again. I said that uh, these are number of, of possibilities where you can end up. Uh, you can again see that there is also, I didn't mention actually the development corporation, development corporation. 
uh, work with and also put our people towards it. So I'm working also since you know, over 20 years with PIZ, Development Corporation, and uh, if there is a job opening, then it will be uh, interested to support us. Thank you very much, Alex. Maybe, can we just go back to the last slide, please, as well? Um, maybe just to um, reinforce what Alex has just said as well. Something that is, um, we very much want to highlight in this, in all of our master's track, but something that Alex has really uh, done a very good job of uh, highlighting is um, just how applicable a qualification urban planning is. Um, many of our, um, many in a classroom, as Alex said, will be from 20 to 25 people of 15 to 20 different nationalities and this will constitute people working in uh, local government who would now like to move into the private sector to push for change from a different orientation equally we have people who are very much interested in sort of developing policies and this program is very helpful for people working in the public sector um, who are need to develop the skills to develop policies uh, but also to um, bring stakeholders with them and work in sort of convincing people to bring interventions through to fruition um, so um, you see from not just the jobs that people have done, not just from the research that they've done, and not even from the countries that they're from, um, but you can really, um, this is a very adaptive uh, program that can really be used in a lot of different settings in developing uh, future urban managers. So can we just move to practical considerations now, please? Yes. So with that in mind, um, and thank you for digging into sort of the course contents there, Alex. Um, as I um, have uh, said earlier, um, so it is an exactly a 12 month course. Generally, we'd say that a lot of our students have some level of professional experience. They might be looking to reorient their career or to move into a sort of more senior management job that this uh, qualification would facilitate. Uh, because of that, the program is an intensive 12 month course running from September to September every year um, with graduation happening in August or beginning of September. Um, the program uh, tuition fee is 14,900 euros. Uh, this is a flat fee for um, all students. Um, if students make applications before the 15th of April, um, so you have a long time to prepare your application if you're in this webinar now, um, and if you complete payment before June 1st, uh, then there will be a 1,000 tuition fee waiver offered to you. Um, and we always stress that this tuition waiver is eligible to anyone who pays before that date um, and can, can be combined with any other sort of tuition waiver or partial tuition waivers that you might uh, source from uh, funding bodies, uh, from private resources, whatever it may be. Uh, we do have a scholarship database on our website, which we do our best to keep up to date. Um, so uh, the reason why we do these webinars now is because we really want to give you all the information you can now. So you have, whether you need two weeks, two months, three months to prepare an application, you have all the information you need to think about finances and all these other practical uh, matters beforehand. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Yes. So uh, bearing that in mind, the admissions requirements. Um, I hope the slides have sort of uh, represented just how uh, diverse the classroom is. And I think that's something that's very important to highlight because um, we don't want to give the impression that there is a, an ideal um, IHS student or that we only want to sort of work with urban planners and sort of uh, make another generation of more urban planners. Uh, that's really not the ethos of the, of the course or of the institute. Uh, we're really looking to sort of foster that um, diversity within the classroom and so that that sort of uh, collaborative learning is taking place. Uh, all we ask is that students are working on uh, from a relatively equal playing field in terms of sort of experiences and abilities. Um, what we say is that we all students must have uh, an, a bachelor undergrad qualification. Um, this must be of a reasonable standard and we'll uh, check academic transcripts as well. So we're looking at one, that you have a demonstrated uh, background, maybe not in urban studies, but in something related to urban studies. Uh, this could be social sciences, this could be geography, this could be um, anything else. Um, we always um, contrast this against the motivation letter that you'll provide as well, where you'll describe an, an urban problem or an urban cause that you would like to uh, develop an intervention for. Um, equally, we need to evidence of a sufficient pr uh, ability with the English language. Uh, this will either be through um, uh, completing your undergrad degree uh, in the English language, and we'll ask for evidence of that uh, if you're from a non-majority uh, English speaking country, um, or providing a, a private language certificate, either an IELTS test or a TOEFL score. We'll also accept these and the, the bans are on our website. Um, finally, as I said, 
Um, a lot of our students will probably have some level of professional exposure, although it's not a criteria, uh, but we're always very interested to see what professional experiences you're bringing to the classroom. So a lot of our students will have two or three years professional experience. So we'll also require a copy of your CV when making an assessment as well. Okay, so I think that was quite a lot of information. Uh, I hope it was clear. Uh, thanks, Alex, for your help in sort of walking us through all that content. What I will do now, um, please feel free, uh, now the presentation is over, uh, to turn your cameras on if you would like to, there's no requirement to, um, and I'm just going to run to the top of the chats and work one by one through the questions, and I'll, work, I'll do my best to answer these together with Alex. Uh, so feel free to just keep asking questions if anything is unclear. Um, and also I'll provide my contact details at the very end of the conversation in case you want to contact uh, the admissions office uh, after the event as well. Okay, so what's the first question. So Mira asks, um, what is the, uh, is there hybrid learning? Uh, what was the experience during the pandemic? Uh, Alex, feel free to jump in on this one, but something that I would say is that um, something that we benefit from is we're a very small institute. Uh, so of in six different master's tracks, we're only about 100 to 150 students. So we benefit from a cl small class size. This is good because it fosters a lot of um, dialogue. Um, there's a lot of sort of participation within the classroom and how that's relevant to the pandemic is it meant that we were able to socially distance uh, during the majority of the pandemic. So we did a hybrid model. Uh, we never went fully online really, except for during lockdowns. Um, and uh, fingers crossed, we're hoping that uh, and this year we're all, all back in the classroom now again. From the beginning, we've already had orientation and we welcomed uh, students uh, to the new class four weeks ago. Uh, and we're hoping that we can all stay in the classroom together for the whole year and definitely for next year as well. Um, so can I conduct my fieldwork in my home country? Um, Alex, can you maybe talk about the fieldwork period in a bit more detail? Yeah, um, th that is, of course, it has two levels. The, the, the one question, because there is another that is related to this um, uh, if the students, if a research topic is chosen there, uh, is there any arrangement for such student to go to home country, to the home country to do the research? So yes, of course you can do, and if you have a relevant subject, you should really do your, your research in your home country because you are the expert of your home country. So it is always beneficial for yourself uh, because you can uh, dig into your own networks, you can work out things that you know or you, you are interested in knowing more in depth. Um, there is no obligation, so you can also choose another country. Uh, traditionally, IHS was actually supporting to do exclusively your field research, your master thesis about your home country that has changed. So nowadays we are looking also into uh, comparable studies or global studies uh, or uh, also in the Netherlands. Some, some of our students from abroad have done their master thesis about the Netherlands. Um, but for the arrangements, um, IHS itself does not provide um, travel fees, so you have to arrange it by yourself. And as far as I know, the NAFIC scholarship also does not provide any possibility now to return to your home country. So you can do research in your home country. We would always encourage to do fieldwork in your home country, or sorry, in, in the country of your fieldwork. Uh, not doing it too remotely, but of course, nowadays also uh, remote research is quite prominent and it's also possible to just stay back in the Netherlands. Enjoy the summer, the only time that you can enjoy the Netherlands really, and uh, work on your thesis. Yes, so something that we always try and stress as well is um, our responsibility is to sort of provide you with all of the, uh, as an enriched sort of learning environment as possible in the first two blocks of the course. Uh, but fundamentally, you are working as independent researchers during the fieldwork period. Um, now, IHS might be on mission, there may, might be active projects happening around the world um, that might be relevant to your topic, but we, we can't work as sort of a direct facilitator in that. So we have students who travel all around the world during the thesis period, but um, that's something that they will have organized uh, by themselves largely, I would say. So. Uh, Anna asks, um, is it necessary to have a previous education, urban planning or architecture? Um, I think we already referenced this in, in, in passing, but just to say that in every year we have, the classroom is completely varied. So there'll be a, 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 some architects in the room, there'll be some urban planners in the room, 
there'll be some civic engineers in the room, but this would only ever make up about half of the classroom. Um, and really it's from a, it's completely varied the sort of backgrounds that are coming through. And in fact, that's largely, um, maybe Alex can speak about this in a bit more detail than me, but one of the reasons really we focus on this model of group work, uh, collaborative learning, uh, especially sort of uh, simulated learning like action planning as well, it's because you'll bring your own uh, field of expertise to that. So you might be working to get, you might be an economist, but you might be working with an architecture and it's through that sort of working together process that you'll build an intervention. Is that sort of fair, Alex? Yes, I think that very much covers it. Uh, we have a, a hand raised by Gavira. Shall we also, because then it might be more correct. Yeah, good idea. Gavira, would you like to? Hello. Hi, Gavira. Hello. Hello. Yes, we Hello. hear you. Yes, good evening, good afternoon, good morning. I'm called Javera from Uganda. I would like to, to find out more about um, the, uh, the admission time because uh, some of us did applications, I think, months ago, but up to now we haven't gotten any response as yet. So how long does it take uh, for the application to be processed? Uh, thank Secondly, and I, I would like to find out when you look at the new fit, when you look at the, the website, uh, they've talked of uh, it's coming to close. They have closed their sponsorship for international students. What happens in such a scenario? Are there any other available scholarships for, for the IH students apart from the OK? Thank you. Thank you, Gavira. Um, I think that's uh, my field of speciality, so I'll answer this question. Uh, but thank you for your questions. Something that I would say is um, we at IHS, we deliberately have a very long admissions period. Um, uh, and so there's a very long time for people to um, uh, prepare their applications. Uh, the reason we do this is so that we give you as much time as possible to secure funding uh, and prepare all of the sort of um, administrative work because um, uh, preparing to move abroad as an international student is a, is a lot of sort of administration that needs to go into it. What I would say, is IHS will um, always process all of our applications within a four week period, but that doesn't necessarily represent when you will hear the admissions decision. Um, so uh, every our admissions period is broken down into uh, four batches. So um, uh, there are four specific dates when admissions decisions are released. Um, Gomera, if you've already applied um, and you haven't heard from us, it's probably because uh, we're waiting for that um, date to release the admissions decisions. However, if you would like some um, individual feedback, please contact the admissions office and we can definitely sort of tell you the status of an application already. But please don't worry, everyone who applies will receive an admission decision from us. Um, you will never not hear from us about uh, the status of an application. Um, relating to the scholarship um, landscape, uh, yes, it's absolutely fair to say uh, the OKP scholarship is winding down. Uh, I understand this is most likely the last year that's going to be in place, at least in the um, structure that it is now. Um, and unfortunately, it's a highly reduced uh, country list. So lots of um, there are just far fewer grants available this year. Uh, but that is not to say that uh, that is the only scholarship um, available to students. And I do ask you to check the scholarship database that we provide on our website. Um, uh, we list the individual criteria, so you should be able to find something that will be workable for you. Um, but I would say probably the most common one that students would go for um, if the OKP is not available to them would probably be the World Bank um, scholarship. We are a participating partner uh, with that uh, program, so we're only one of 30 schools uh, that are eligible for that scholarship. So you would have a, a relatively competitive chance of applying for that. and that. Um, that scholarship is open all the way up until the summer, I believe, as well. So I hope that was helpful. Um, maybe I don't see any other hands, so I'm going to go back to the questions in the chat. Okay. It's quite a lot of questions. Um, Craig asks, what is the average student teach instruction, instructor time per week, be it lectures, seminars, studios for terms one and two? Alex, would you be able to jump in on this? Uh, if I get an explanation of what term one and two means. If term uh, one block and one and block two, means, I think. Uh, yeah, the, the, the block one uh, is different to block two. 
uh, even within this uh, master tracks, we have differences. Uh, I would just to talk to our specialization, uh, we have about uh, four to six hours of lectures uh, per week. Uh, we have a number of seminars counting also the working group. We have like 15 to 20 hours max uh, of seminars in studios and the rest study time. So you would be in class like half of the week and the other half have an individual study time for extended work. Yeah. Generally, what we always advise students as well is um, the program is intensive. So, um, and your schedule will be changing quite a lot because you'll be in different uh, working groups and doing different programs uh, throughout the year, which is so it will vary a little bit. Um, but generally, the consensus is quite an intensive program. So, you may only have 15 to 20 hours of um, uh, scheduled seminars, for example, per week. But there will be an expectation that a lot of that time will be used for private study, working on group works, working on assignments. Um, so yeah, I think uh, it's a, something to bear in mind is that you will be sort of required to be at IHS or at least available for sort of group work four to five days a week in terms of one and two, I would say. Okay, Mira asks, I did my bachelor's in English. Should I provide an English certificate in that case? Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Mary. That's a, that's a great question for the admissions team. So um, uh, everyone needs to provide some um, uh, proof of English ability. However, as an admission, as the admissions office, we do have the uh, right to waive that requirement. So if you're from um, the UK, if you're from Australia, if you're from uh, the US, uh, there'll be no need to show an English uh, degree. And that's also true for English speaking countries um, uh, around the world. Um, uh, however, there are certain uh, countries which provide English uh, higher education, but it's not uh, standard. That might be in somewhere like uh, Pakistan or Iran, but they do have English speaking colleges where we would require evidence, uh, a certificate with your bachelor's that say it was completed in the English language, but that would be accepted as a waiver. However, if you are not able to provide this, we would ask you to get um, uh, an IELTS test or a TOEFL test. And we always advise them to get the, those as well, just because they're very valuable to have uh, in later life when you're completing different applications as well. So Lotta asks, I did a bachelor's in applied science at Hagsahov School in urban development. Can I apply? And is there a pre-masters that I will need to do? Thanks Lotta, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, something we would say is that uh, generally IHS would, doesn't accept um, uh, applications from students from uh, applied science schools in the Dutch system. However, as I said, the we're looking at at least five to six different criteria when we're looking at an application. So and we would and we would almost never uh, discount an application based on one criteria on its own. So uh, your academic background might not be um, directly relevant, but uh, uh, but the topic is highly relevant. So if you could uh, make a case for your interest in the course, together with some professional experience or volunteer work, I think you could make a reasonably strong application. Uh, we don't offer a pre-master at IHS, and th that's not a product that we have in place currently. Um, but what I would do is you're absolutely welcome to apply. And what I would also say is the admissions office um, rarely makes an admissions decision on our own. We always do it in concert with the academic department as well. So um, we would do this if you can make a strong application. Uh, there's a possibility that the academic team or the admissions team would think you would be a viable uh, candidate for the classroom. Thank you so much. Great. No worries. <laughs> okay, Gavira, um, I've uh, we've answered this already. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Mira asks again, why I'm studying the program? Can I attend conferences? Uh, so it's a great question. Um, uh, just, just to say, there is a we do offer something called the IHS and I campaign as well. So this is very much tailored towards um, uh, supplementary or non-academic work that sort of enhances your experience at IHS. Um, so these and this was done together with program management. So there will be um, uh, one social trip um, within the Netherlands. There will hopefully be a non-academic trip somewhere else in Europe as part of the program as well. Um, and away from that, you will have access to all the guest lectures uh, that are offered at IHS and all the um, conferences that are offered by IHS ourselves as well. 
Uh, previously, we had a 60 years conference, which our students were welcome to attend for free. Uh, equally, I know that a lot of our students have attended conferences elsewhere uh, in Europe. Um, uh, we had a student from our uh, environment and climate change specialization uh, who received sponsorship to go to a uh, conference in Germany uh, last year, but he did that independently. But what I can say is, so you're welcome to attend conferences. Uh, IHS sadly doesn't have any budget to uh, supplement the cost of those. But there are um, uh, external bodies that you can apply for funding to go to those conferences uh, if you would like to as well. Uh, Guy Vera asks, what is the likelihood that the OKP will be reintroduced in the coming years? Um, it's a great question, Guy Vera. We, we, we simply don't know. Uh, this is uh, a decision being made by the Dutch government currently, and it's uh, currently under negotiation. So we really can't say uh, what the possibilities will be, but obviously, um, it's something that we're very um, keen to sort of keep an eye on and we will obviously be updating our website as information changes. Okay, so Maxwell asks, the OKP scholarship is very competitive um, and I wasn't able to get it. Is there an alternative scholarship? So Maxwell, please check the uh, scholarship database because it really has almost all of the information that we have within the Institute as well, funding options. Um, and also, please don't get discouraged if you didn't achieve the scholarship one year, that really has no bearing on if you could make a good application the following year. Um, and as I said, the, the, there are less countries that are eligible to apply, so you might have a better chance this year as well. Okay, will I be trained, uh, trained in GIS? Uh, Alex, what is our GIS provision within the course? You give me all the bad questions. I would have loved <laughs> to answer the, the other ones. It would have been more fun. Uh, yes, uh, there is a, a GIS introductory course, which is actually not part of our master track, but it's now a, a part of the general uh, introductory uh, session, the term one or the, the first block, uh, where you will get uh, a one week training in GIS, which of course is not sufficient then to be a GIS specialist. So people that are more interested into uh, planning, I think there's also, you can le learn that online. It's a skill uh, that is very technical and the use GIS not necessarily in that. So you also don't need it. But of course, if you need it for your profession later on, then you can definitely uh, learn it um, within three course to, to understand how it works. And then later you can uh, deepen it. Yeah, I think it's very important to say so. There are some sort of universal skills that our students uh, repeatedly return to and are a real focus for them. Uh, GIS is something that is something that is uh, highly popular with students. That's why we've incorporated this training program. Equally, something to just bear in mind that all of our students will um, receive an inter inter introductory session on urban sustainability within the first block of the program as well. Um, as well as uh, completing a course in social sciences research methods. So we are giving you quite a, a, a wide um, uh, and useful sort of bedrock of um, so of uh, trainings and skills. Um, but again, it's um, it's if you wanted to develop those further, you would need to do those independently as well. Okay, Craig asks. Thanks for the. You're very welcome, Craig. <laughs> Um, and Guyvira asks, is it possible to do a student apprenticeship in the course of study? So unfortunately, Guyvira, we actually have no provision for student apprenticeship or paid um, student positions. Um, we, we simply just don't have that provision. Um, we do always have a, um, a board of student advisors, though. So you're welcome to run in the uh, student elections to be one of the class representatives. Uh, we always have uh, uh, normally four representatives who are responsible for uh, feeding back on sort of uh, student concerns and feedback, and they actually have a very active role in sort of shaping how um, the course is delivered. So that would be something you could do, but it wouldn't be in any way um, a way to subsidize the cost of attending the program, I'm afraid, if that's what you were interested in. Yeah, and maybe I, uh, to, to interpret the, the question from a different angle, uh, maybe what is meant in internship, uh, yeah. there is no built-in internship requirement, so uh, we had a couple of students that were working uh, within their master thesis. It's highly recommendable that it's not something well, but you will engage, for example, with the institution that you write your master thesis about. So this is a possibility that we've seen and that it's possible. Yeah, uh, but we do have um, um, an active portfolio of internship positions. 
Uh, we are normally looking for graduates for those positions, so you would be welcome to apply after you had joined, uh, after you had graduated from IHS. Uh, but again, these are full time commitments, so it wouldn't be able to be something that you could do whilst you were studying. Okay, so um, that feels to me like all the questions. I hope I haven't missed anyone. Uh, but generally, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this afternoon. Uh, I think it was a really beneficial session. As I said, if you do have any individual questions, uh, especially at the admissions office, we're always happy to answer questions on an individual basis. If anything wasn't clear, uh, or if you would like some sort of tailored information on preparing an application, please contact our offices. I'm always happy to answer those as best we can. And similarly, if you'd like to speak to Alex, I'm happy to forward emails over, and he's always happy to answer them as well. I know. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, just to say thank you very much. Thank you very much from IHS. I think it was a really beneficial session um, and I look forward to receiving your applications and for me and Alex to welcome you hopefully next September. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'll close out the session, I think. Thank you.